More generally, progress is not a mystical force, but it depends on embracing the ideals of the Enlightenment. Imposed philosophic morality will not save the world. Many people know what they uh, are opposed to, but it is not as easy to say uh, what we embrace. Only a calculated, tangible plan to alter our, alter our circumstances so that such actions pose no merit will stop what we consider to be immoral behavior. We have to assess this. We have to figure out exactly what we have. And then we have to generate a system, a logical system, of distributing these resources in a way that actually makes sense with respect to natural law. What I mean by that, we have decision-making processes through industry that's based entirely on the motivation of money. So you have to make something. You're looking at numbers and cost efficiency. You're relating to industries. You're going to use things based only on your cost efficiency and the patterns you need. Uh, that's not the way a real economy would work. Real economy would take resources that we have and assess them for their scientific le relevance, assess them for what they're actually supposed to do, what their highest but efficacy is. But who does is. the assessment? The assessment is done by reason. And this is something that people hate it when I say it, because they think that somebody in some round table in some Soviet circle uh -huh. is going to make all the decisions for all the world. One of the great psychological revolutions, great sociological revolutions that has to occur if we intend to survive on this planet is we have to stop delegating decision making to people and delegating decision making to a process of rational thought and logic. Namely, applying reason and science to enhance human flourishing. If we continue to apply the ideals of the Enlightenment, we could have a reasonable expectation that progress might continue. But if we don't, it uh, may not. We can calculate society now. Human well-being can be measured. Life, health, sustenance, prosperity, peace, freedom, safety, knowledge, leisure, happiness. If they have increased over time, I submit that is progress. Let's go to the data. Science has only been with us really in application for about 600 years. We can calculate what the greatest conductor of conducting metal is and why it should be used in certain forms and not in others. We can apply this type of reasoning to everything. And I don't mean some utopianistic thing where suddenly there's a matrix and everything's ca calculated. That's an ideal. That probably isn't reality, at least not now. But that's the way we should approach our thought process. We have to arrive at conclusions, not base them on traditional notions or pre-existing systems. In Enlightenment Now, I suggest that there is an alternative system of beliefs and values, namely the ones that we associate with the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, I suggest, revolves around four themes, reason, science, humanism, and progress. Let me say a few words about each. In a nutshell, that we can use knowledge to enhance human flourishing. You and Both failures are frightening. Right. Right. Mm. You really don't want a state uh, nannying you um, and over-regulating the market and taking the magic out of it. And you don't want the completely unregulated landscape where the market you know, starts probing the minds of your children and figuring out how to sell them things that they don't have any ability to resist. Right. You need to figure out what that path is, and it's not easy. Now, inequality within wealthy countries has uh, notoriously been increasing, but that does not mean that developed countries have become increasingly uh, callous toward the poor. Quite the contrary. Uh, for hundreds of years, no developed country uh, gave, uh, devoted more than 1.5% of its wealth to social transfers, that is, to supporting children, the poor, the elderly, and the sick. When you have that trait of thought, you see that there's no solution within the market economy. There's no way to twist it. You can't twist the arm of the market system unless you over-legislate the shit out of it. Thanks to these social transfers, uh, poverty has been declining even as inequality has been increasing. But in the 20th century, every developed country embarked on a massive program of income redistribution so that today and, uh, the median among OECD countries uh, of redistribution is 22% of GDP. Right. I mean, you just have to go in there and, and you know, for example, what I, if people talk about transitional ideas, and I'm going to get to the other train of thought here in a second, they talk about, well, you know, how, we don't know how to make this transition. What can we do in the meantime? And there's one suggestion I have, which, of course, requires the state, unfortunately, and that's cre you create universal guaranteed income in every country. So you might say, well, we have a guaranteed annual income for people, which I think is a horrible solution, by the way. If you had that, where does it come from? You take it off the top of the exuberant 1% and 0.1% that are making thousands of times more than the vast population anyway. 1% of the 
people in the general population have the overwhelming amount of money, and one-tenth of that 1% has almost all of that. It's like, okay, we can agree on that. We've got the parameters set. Now we, have to, now we have to start thinking very carefully through how to do the redistribution issue, and we don't know how to do that. And how you get that universal guaranteed income, meaning a livable wage for people, you know, so if someone makes here, I don't know what the living standard is here, it's very high, obviously, but I assume if someone made 3,000 pounds a month, they might be able to survive fairly well. Yeah. But it addresses the right problem. The problem is, is that we're hyperproductive, but the spoils go to those at the top. And some of those resources need to be funneled down to the people who have zero so that they have an opportunity to at least get to the point where they can innovate and so the bloody, whole bloody thing doesn't wobble and fall. Dr. James Gilligan, which I know you've interviewed, he's the former head of the study of violence at Harvard, extremely brilliant man who studied this as a prison psychologist and his, his core statement, you want to reduce violence in society, reduce inequality. Inequality drives crime. Now you can say, you can argue about why, but the fact that it does is that's not disputable. So we could have an intelligent discussion between the left and the right, and the discussion would go something like this. You need innovation, you pay for innovation with inequality, but you need to bind inequality because if it's too intense, then things destabilize. Maybe to give our audience an example of, of one issue that you tackle in the book, we could talk a little bit about poverty. And you know, I think we, we all can probably imagine the people we know uh, who approach poverty from, you know, this is sort of the way things are. Despite our system, poverty is an inevitability. It's always there. It's always going to be there. Um, is progress inevitable? And the answer is, of course not. All right, then you play another game of Monopoly. What happens? One person ends up with all the money. It's actually the inevitable consequence of multiple trades that are conducted randomly. Because as you shovel money down, it tends to move right back up. Once again, this would be an ex a dubious example of progress if all of the gains were simply going to the uh, proverbial 1%. So it's, it's pure socialism, straight wealth distribution. But in fact, they have been applied to reduce the rate of extreme poverty. Uh, Peter Edwards of Newcastle University put out what he called the ethical poverty line, which is based on lifespan, not the metrics put out by the UN. Extreme poverty, usually defined as the bare minimum necessary to feed oneself and one's family. Which is based on lifespan, not the metrics put out by the UN. By that criterion, $1.90 in 2015 per day, in 1820, 90% of the world met the criterion for extreme poverty that has fallen to less than 10%. And when you use this ethical poverty line, you find that 60% of the world is actually in poverty. With most of the reductions taking place just in the last few decades, 75% reduction in the rate of extreme poverty just since uh, 1990. Well, the greatest inefficiency would be the fact that we have poverty at all. If you measure poverty by disposable income, that is after taxes and transfers, then uh, about 32% of the American population was uh, below the poverty line in 1960. That has fallen to less than uh, 7%. And if you measure poverty by consumption, what people can afford to live on, it's gone from 30% to less than 3%. So the fact that you have five people now with more wealth than the bottom half of the world, and you have close to a billion people not getting their nutrition met, that is, is lunacy from an efficiency standpoint. No one can sit there and claim that this is an efficient system when that's the outcome on the social level. It's, it's not a consequence necessarily of structural inequality. It's built into the system at a deeper level than that. Socioeconomic inequality, basically class stratification, has been held up as some kind of innovator force, some force of innovation. Oh, yeah, that's about the only defense of it you'll hear. Innovation is the engine of growth and prosperity in a society. You better bloody well wa watch out because when you radically make things egalitarian, you're gonna wipe out all your productive people and then you're gonna starve. They'll say, well, you know, you gotta have poor people that aspire to be rich people and that will create the engine of innovation. And so that's, that's one of the doom end scenarios that awaits us if this idiot process of polarization continues. And more nonsense is produced by industry. That's effectively the only defense I've ever heard of stratification, other than people claiming it's a biological reality. And right? It's something like a natural law, and we can, we'll talk about that more, but imagine what happens when you play Monopoly. You've all played Monopoly. What happens when you play Monopoly? One person ends up with all the money. Uh, if you look, 99% of human society exists without money in markets. A lot of people forget that too. So this isn't some inevitability the way we live. 
So if you take a thousand people and you get them to play a trading game, you, get, you each give them hundred dollars, say, or ten dollars, and they have to trade with another person by flipping a coin. I, I win the coin toss, you give me a dollar, you win, I give you a dollar. If we all play that long enough, one person will end up with all the money and everyone else will end up with zero. When you look at all of these behaviors and you look at how they're linked, you establish two trains of thought. First, you see the market trade of thought, and the market's not going to change. It is the leading cause of death on the planet Earth at this point. The very basic nature of it says we are going to preserve scarcity. We need it. We need all this consumption to keep things going. We are going to use up the Earth's resources as fast as possible. We're also going to have massive wealth divides because the game of capitalism is explicitly based on advantage, and any game of advantage is going to create imbalance. So it's a deeply built feature of systems of creative production, and no one really knows what to do about it. And the answer to that is the application of design efficiency and technology. And as I get to the end of this book, I hone in on those specific points that have actually underscored the benefit of our economic efficiency, benefit of us as in our public health and so on. And I isolate those from the market, and I want to encourage people to develop a new system that harnesses those issues, harnesses the amazing efficiency we've achieved, achieved as human beings, as intelligent thinkers, as opposed to this archaic system that is lost in what's called the Malthusian period. It's lost in this Malthusian, Machiavellian, highly scarcity-driven world. Because, of course, the danger is, is that all the resources get funneled to a tiny minority of people at the top, and a huge section of the population stacks up at zero. But to blame that on the oppressive nature of a given system is to radically underestimate the complexity of the problem. So I apologize, I've deviated a bit from your question. When people approach me with the communist duality, I pretty much just have to stop them and begin a long explanation that what they're referencing is a false duality to begin with, and that if you really want to get down to it, here are the, here's the train of thought. Here are the attributes that have defined our society and made it better. Why can't we simply amplify these attributes without any of these ideological uh, stigmas and interference. And sadly enough, stigmas and labels and interference has been a great way to, to dismiss a lot of these ideas over time. So it's unfortunately a, a current that we have to walk against still in the 21st century.